Whatever is more convenient. Uh, it isn't, isn't it? It's not uncomfortable, is it? No. No. Are you expecting to be served a drink? I probably have. I'm uh, sorry. No, you have. You are oh, not expecting. You are not <laughs> expecting to be to be to be offered a drink. You brought your own drink, actually. <laughs> That's one well, way yes. to do it. Uh, John Crane is a former official of Pentagon, where he was managing the hotline for whistleblowers based on the Protection of Whistleblowers Act from 1989. And he himself was fired when he complained about his superior's treatment of another whistleblower. Tell us what happened. Um, I was fired, um, well, there were several reasons, first of all, that um, we just listened to Edward Snowden, and when he decided not, not to go through the established whistleblower program, what he referenced was he saw a very significant high-profile espionage trial, and that trial involved Edward Snowden, and he was a senior executive at the National Security Agency, and he had been one of our most important confidential informants. Um, with the Inspector General Act, that when you come forward, that we try to make sure that you are not retaliated against. And so we keep the names secret. Um, he actually helped us shut down one of the most important NSA programs. It uh, was a multi-billion dollar program, and it was largely regarding surveillance. Subsequently, um, that the federal government tried to prosecute him um, under the World War I Espionage Act, which is a fairly narrow law that you can have fairly wide interpretations to, depending upon who was in the Department of Justice. Um, so they tried to have him prosecute it. And what they did and what was concerned, what concerned me at least, was that when he had his house raided, I wanted to know how, how the outside world found out that he was one of our most important confidential informants. That when they had his house raided, and there was a, there was a 1995 New York Times article, and that article talked about warrantless whistleblowing, and it talked about the fact that the federal government, just like Mr. Snowden said, mm -hmm. had, um, had monitored U.S. nationals. Uh, the way U.S. Na the, uh, US laws work is that the U.S. intelligence agencies cannot monitor U.S. nationals. That is against the, against the, the law. Um, so then the FBI, at the request of the president, started a formal investigation. And they tried to figure out who the whistleblowers were. Because Drake was one of our whistleblowers, talking about surveillance, that they thought that he might have been one of the sources for the New York Times, as it was subsequently discovered he was not a source. Edward Snowden had his house raided. And then he had 10 separate criminal charges brought against him. Mm -hmm. And they were brought against him because when the FBI raided his house, that they found doc documents that they subsequently said were classified, but then when they reviewed them once again, they were found not to be classified. Mm -hmm. And so then the trial collapsed. But what the issue was is when his defense attorneys contacted us, that they wanted to see all the various communications 
our agents had with them because they wanted to know whether or not he had maintained documents at his home simply because we had asked him to. So oh my God. Th yeah. then the question was, what, was he under trial facing 35 years in prison because he had complied with U.S. federal request to him to keep that information? And so I wanted to have it investigated. And I had a fairly large investigative staff because I was in charge of, of um, the uh, Defense Department's whistleblower program that we have 700,000 civilians, 1.2 million military. And so we actually comprise half the federal government. And so I was responsible to receive whistleblower complaints from half the federal workforce. And then my job was, was to also educate federal employees what their actual whistleblower rights were and to actually encourage them to come forward. That when you join the federal workforce, you sign oaths. And one of them is you will proactively report waste, fraud, and abuse and crimes. So I wanted to find the various documents. Um, and these were secret, top secret, sensitive intelligence documents. And they were destroyed, that they just couldn't be found. And I objected to that. And I said that we had a major problem here. And then the uh, US Justice Department asked us whether we had those documents destroyed according to standard federal document destruction procedures. Hillary Clinton had various problems regarding maintaining federal <laughs> documents also. So, so, so um, this is a problem that certainly exists. And what the senior management told the Justice Department was those documents ha had been destroyed according to standard record retention policies. The problem there was um, I was in charge of the Freedom of Information Act office, and that lets, that lets anyone, U.S. citizens, U.S. nationals also, to um, write the U.S. government to ask whether or not they can access federal records. Um, I was the FOIA appellate authority. And what that meant was, should my staff turn you down, you could then appeal to me, and I, I could then reveal the, uh, uh, have it reviewed, and, and then your next appeal would be to, to the federal court system. And um, I never had one of my rulings overturned. But so, so we had a problem where we had documents destroyed where they shouldn't have it been destroyed because we need to know when they were destroyed, who they were destroyed by, when they were destroyed by, because when you lose classified documents, that's a major issue. And should you not know why, you don't know whether they, they have been revealed to a foreign power. You just have to know where these documents are. And, and so um, I then objected. And I said that we had lied to the Department of Justice, that I wasn't allowed to investigate. And then I was walked out of the office because I wasn't a team player. 
Now, <laughs> now um, <laughs> what's happening right now is uh, within the federal government, you have various appeals processes. And one office is the Office of Special Counsel. And that office investigates whether or not a crime could have occurred. And I've been working with them now for the past 18 months. And they will rule soon whether there's a substantial likelihood that there was a crime. Regarding Drake, that, that I went to the Office of Special Counsel, I uh, laid everything out, that they found on the substantial likelihood standard that there was a crime, that, that there is right now an uh, active, ongoing criminal investigation taking place, and um, that report, um, once it is issued, that first of all, it'll be made public, and then it will be sent to the president and, and the Speaker of the House, and then also the uh, Senate President Pro Tem. Um, one of the wonderful things about the Office of Special Counsel is unlike unlike any other investigative agency, that when they have a final report, they will actually make it public. So regarding Drake, that we should know in about six or seven months whether or not there was a crime committed. So so you, you, you're conferring my, my impression that life is not easy in the secret world, is it? It's fairly complicated. It seems to me that there is a murky world of people who can use regulations, use security decisions, use um, practices, use all that sort of thing to their own end in a way. I mean, is there a lacking political way of penetrating this? Is there a, a system which has actually grown out of the reach of democratically elected politicians who are there to yeah. make it fair? The way law ought to be applied is that it needs to needs to be applied evenly to all citizens. Thomas Drake faced 35 years in jail because he might have had a couple of classified documents which were then subsequently unclassified. Um, there's a second investigation taking place and that was whether or not the then defense Secretary Leon Panetta released top secret information to uh, various Hollywood movie producers, and and um, Oliver Stone was he one of them? Perhaps no, he was no, he not. Was not. Okay, no. no, no, he was not. And and um, that issue was um, when Osama Oladen was killed that it was a very dramatic event. And um, the White House tried to establish the president as a very strong, forceful figure. And so then Hollywood wanted to make a movie. And they wanted to have that event dramatized. And so they then contacted the White House and they contacted the CIA, and they also contacted DOD, and they met with senior officials. And those senior officials gave them top secret information that, it, that they could use so that they could understand how the raid actually took place. So um, we investigated. And we found, simply based upon transcripts, recordings, closed circuit television, that there was top secret information revealed, that we had the investigative findings, that we had the reports written, 
that, um, that these were just before the November 2012 elections. And then the inspector general said, these reports will not be issued because these reports could hurt the White House. There you go, yeah. So, so um, I uh, then objected. And as a whistleblower, because I had never exercised whistleblower rights before, I mean, even though I was responsible for 2.1 million people exercising whistleblower rights, I uh, simply contacted Congress, hmm. and I then informed them what had happened. And then I was marched into the front office, and then I was removed under physical escort simply because you were literally I, I had reported to Congress out. a crime. Yeah, okay. So, so th th that's out, out there too, and uh, they expect to have a final investigative conclusion on that, and that should be interesting as well. The beauty of the principle of pardoning is that things, acts which are being interpreted as criminal acts according to yes. the law, could be considered to be valuable to society and not criminal. I mean, you could sort of change yes. the character of the act. Yes. Should the constitutional expert, mm -hmm. Barack Obama, mm -hmm. have pardoned uh, Edward Snowden? And could he still do that in the short period he, have, he has left in, in the White House? Edward Snowden faces several options um, that what he can do and s since the facts are not in question, Edward Snowden leaked information, he leaked top secret classified information, that what the US legal system doesn't allow, and, and it's not allowed because the World War I Espionage Act doesn't allow it, is he can't use the argument that what he did, he did for the public good. And so as a result, a judge cannot factor that into a sentence, and it is not a defense. That should he return to the US, that, that, that he will simply go to jail because those are the sentencing terms. You mean the president cannot pardon him? Oh, no. Yeah, that's no. how you're yes. coming to that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so should he not be pardoned, that should he return, he will be sentenced to jail. And then the only question is, does he have a plea bargain whereas the, does he face life in prison, 50 years in prison, 25 years in prison? The, f the former Attorney General, Eric Holden, and he was Attorney General until, I think, uh, only about eight, mm. 18 months ago, that he has talked extensively regarding whether or not there should be public interest considered. Now, the other options are what the Constitution allows presidents is they can give pardons. And they can give pardons regarding prospective charges. President Ford gave a pardon to Richard Nixon because he was concerned that there might be a national drama having a former president on trial. Normally pardons act retroactively. Someone's committed a crime. Edward Snowden committed a crime. Will he be pardoned? The president, unlike the courts, he can use a public interest defense. So, so um, he can have him pardoned, and since he is in his final months in office, 
that he needs to think about what his actual legacy will be. And he has spent the last six years working Appeal. with a Republican Congress. Mm. And much of what he, he has accomplished has been through executive orders. And they don't have the force of law. What the executive order does is, since he's in control of the federal government, he can tell the federal government what it should do with its lands, mm. what it could do regarding regulations. And, but, so, what that means is, subsequent presidents can simply repeal any executive order. So his so, successor could just as easily crumple the paper together and just throw it into the wastebasket. Exactly. Yeah, right. E exactly. Will so, he? Will he? Well, <laughs> but I mean, is there, is, there, is, there, is there a calculable risk that he will actually do that, based on what he has said about these tropics earlier? I mean, what could we expect? To the be, incoming the president the elect, president, yeah, um, has been very explicit. He has indeed, yes. And he has said he will repeal everything that he can repeal. And so when the current president wants to think about the legacy, because one of his legacies had been Obamacare, and that will be dismantled. Oh. It has been announced it will be simply, di simply dismantled that one of the only ways that he can really create a legacy would be through those items that can't be challenged. Mm. A pardon cannot be challenged. Okay. So let's send a message. Should we all? John, <laughs> that's up to you. You'll be, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your, uh, for your uh, frank presentation right. of it all. Yeah, you're, you're, you. You, were indeed, you. you were indeed drawing up a picture which shows us the problems <laughs> we were, we're up against. Uh, we'll be back to you in a moment. But okay. uh, first, we have uh, Modi and his friends on the stage once again. Please.